Go ahead, Doug. Well, I was going to say, I'm going to transition into the great sadness of John Williams. And I, cause I think it's kind of sets up to the legacy, right? Cause we're all here about this great body of work. And I, I want to take us through, uh, you know, the development of film music really quick. Cause I'm going to mention some names here and I'm going to leave out a ton of other names, but, but we started this journey back with, with Korngold and Steiner, right? And they transitioned it, gave it over to Rotsa and, and Bernstein and Young. Uh, and then eventually it got into Goldsmith and John Williams. And so we can see this great, a journey of film music and now we're in a place where i don't see that those the, 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 these guys stepping up to the plate and it's not the composer's fault i think the producers of movies nowadays have really discounted the um uh, uh, importance of the sound production sped up too so that's well yeah the other the other thing is and i i've talked to i have i am lucky enough to know a lot of studio players and I have conversations with them and they know what, what I think about their current <laughs> uh, um, uh, music. But, uh, and, and, and they're saying one of the problems is the real estate, the, the footprint. They don't have as much sound footprint as they used to because it only used to be what the, the speaking voice, some FOI music, FOI sound effects. And then you had, um, after that, you got into the music and you had like three things going on on the sound nowadays. There could be 10 things going on in the soundtrack of the explosions and, and, and uh, uh, imaging and all those sorts of things. So they really don't want uh, a good symphonic soundtrack nowadays. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard balance. So even if there is that next John Williams, is he going to be given the opportunity or she uh, to step forward and, and, really, and really take it? I don't know. Yeah, that's a question I had wanted to actually There's bring so up at mixed, some sorry, point. Quite, well, that's a question I wanted to bring up is, you know, in this age where I think there has been a shift and John Williams has kind of followed along with that shift in some ways, but still retained his, his own voice. Um, are we going to see someone that is going to bring back that symphonic sound that John Williams made famous in the 70s and, and tried to continue 40 years later? I don't think so. I think... Uh, um we're seeing the end of an era, to be honest. I think John's ability to gain the trust of directors was pretty unique. I mean, Spielberg just basically allowed him to do what he thought was best in a lot of ways. I mean, it took him some convincing when uh, he went over to Johnny's house to play the, you know, the theme from Billy. It was a joke at first, but he he bowed to john's you know uh, uh experience and um, he he often tells the the joke when he first heard um jo one of john's scores he thought it was this you know really old prophet <laughs> with a long beard you know type of uh, composer and he met what he says is this young john williams um but I, I think that type of collaboration is quite rare. I mean, it is really rare. I mean, look what, what John's been able to do over the course of his career just with Star Wars. No, no one's been able to have that many sequels of movies, you know, back to back to back and to be able to graph together uh, so many themes uh, like that. I, I just think that, that that's not going to happen again. And um, we should enjoy it while it lasts because. Uh, you know, who knows how, how much longer we're going to have him. I actually think in, um, you know, when, when we're thinking about the next John Williams or kind of the context in which John Williams has made his mark, um, I would probably zoom out a little and, and take it beyond just the world of film scores. You know, when I think of the, uh, not to, you know, make a bad pun, uh, but the baton John Williams has kind of taken from his predecessors, I actually think more along the lines of, you know, Leonard Bernstein, George Gershwin, Aaron Copeland, um, who were not known for their film scores. I know Bernstein did, I think, just one. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I kind of wonder if the next, you know, quote, the quote unquote, the next John Williams um, may exist in a space outside of film scores um, in the same way that, you know, Leonard Bernstein was known for 
you know, the musicals he wrote, the, the symphonic music he wrote, the education work that he did. Um, Copeland did a lot of ballets and some operas. Um, and maybe the next step uh, for kind of the, you know, and maybe it's within a context of American composers, maybe it's within a context of composers who write music that is both high quality, but also accessible to, um, you know, to uh, people who, uh, you know, aren't, uh, you know, ha haven't kind of invested their entire lives in music, music that speaks to a general population, as well as, uh, you know, the, the musical elite. Um, I think maybe we should be looking not just in the world of film scores, but to me, the new landscape is video yeah, games. But where would you look, David? Video I mean, games. You know, you've got video games, TV, so film is kind of where people end up. Um, I mean, I, actually, Jeff, you and I were talking about this that the great composers of, you know, the 18th century, 19th century, they had. Their, their medium was opera and symphony. And so now we've evolved into, you know, are there great symphonic composers whose primary medium, whose primary canvas is the symphony orchestra? Not as much. That's why John Williams, the primary medium we just, of that's our got a new era. Medal of honor score. Getting, the, yeah. You know, so the new Nami Medal of Michael Giacchino Medal of Honor score is... Television, television is not as famously at least now, not a place where I would think the next John Williams is going to show up. And that's why my view on his legacy is I, I, there's just nobody who has been so prolific and had partnership with a filmmaker as prolific. I mean, filmmakers these days don't crank out, you know, three films a year. Spielberg is perfectly capable or uh, some parts of his career was perfectly capable of cranking out three very good films, two or three a year. So I, I just don't think we'll ever see the likes of that partnership for sure. And in terms of, you know, composers who've got this body of symphonic work, choral work, you know, film scores, TV scores. I mean, there, there will never be a John Williams. I think something else to um, take into consideration, and this is looking at it from um, like an ac academic um, standpoint, is that film music was always that person in my school's music department that, you know, was like, was, was swinging for film music from some other people's points of views. But anyway, um, uh, we're, we're, we're about 10, 12 years off from hitting the first century of sort of film scores as we know them with uh, Steiner's King Kong was probably the first kind of like landmark, like this is what film scoring is going to be like for the next 50, 60, 70 years. So, you know, if, if you look at any era of, of music history, be it the Renaissance, Baroque, classical, impressionistic, 20th century, probably being the best sort of model for it is that um, it's, changing all the time for whatever reason fads new technologies um you know suddenly now we're, we're in an era where um everyone has access to some piece of music technology be it on their ipad or their phone you can go out and do recordings um and uh i think sort of now we're we're entering the next phases of of the evolution of film music clearly. Uh, but I think though the, the symphony orchestra will never go away because it's just such an effective tool to convey emotion. It's just sort of going to be recontextualized thanks to things people mentioned beforehand, like the filmmaking process is a lot faster now. You can do mock-ups. Um, you know, you can hear what your score is gonna sound like before you even go to the scoring stage now. Um, so we're still we're still very much in the first hundred years, which is something I think I often sort of forget that uh, we're not, you know, this this medium yes, is not even. That's very true, actually, and I think that also the terms, the term film music is probably reductive. Nowadays we have to call uh, call it media music because it's film, TV, video games. Of course, they are they can be very different from each other, but basically it's it's going to be a a kind of a single medium, not very much many years from now, uh, where we get music, music written for, for, for visual media. 
I don't know, I think Grammys now, they call it music for motion picture and visual media, like because they want to be inclusive about uh, also video games or other maybe future venues that we still don't know of. So basically we have to understand that the legacy of John Williams lies probably in the, in the people who, are, who will be able to understand the craft that he was able to, um, to build upon you know, decades. And that is very important. Now, many composers have, as you said, uh, Eduardo, uh, have access to, a, to some kind of technology tool that makes them able to produce some kind of music. But if you think about the, the greatness of John Williams, is also because he honed his craft for a long time, you know, basically, and even though he, he didn't complete, you know, a, a, a perfect academic uh, path, you know, he didn't finish the music school properly. He, 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 was, he was kind of, you know, uh, pulled into the, into the studio, starting to play and um, breathing music and understanding uh, how the music work from the greats like uh, Alfred Newman or Bernard Herrmann and, and understanding that there was a huge amount of craft he had to learn. You know, that, that's, I think, is the key to, to if, if there will be a, another John Williams in the future, like a, a hair or, you know, a new Jedi in the height, so to speak, you know, that, that person who, whatever who will be, have to study the craft. That This is the, the key for me. Yeah, I, like, I agree. Um, I think that there's the definition of an ex-John Williams is so broad. And you also have to think about the time frame when he came up. Um, there was an oversaturation of just media all over the place now. And it is almost impossible for a film like whatever is coming out to gain traction. So if you think about Star Wars, how long was that released for? It was like a year, a year and a half. You could just go back that next weekend. And on top of that, if you look at what was released in 1977, there weren't that many movies. Like Star Wars was probably the only film released during that, that weekend. And, 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 those, and so once we get into the summer blockbusters, now you've got five, six, seven different films coming out and it's almost impossible to soak all that in. And so Williams and Spielberg and Lucas, they had time to let that kind of uh, marinate and let everybody experience it. But the other thing about Williams and where he got lucky was not only with Spielberg, but was with the Boston Pops and what that allowed him to do for what was it, 13, 14 years, was to expose everybody not only to film music, but musicals and whatnot, but also his own music. He used that as a way to introduce people to Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, Witches of Eastwick. And, and that's where his, his music got to grow. And so for someone to be the next John Williams, and as uh, Mauricio said, that, I mean, you need to have the knowledge. I mean, and that's, I think, is one of the biggest problems is that, is knowing the history of film music and, and appreciating that and celebrating that as well as what is being written today. But you, you need somebody that's going to go out in and maybe create a concert program that is going to celebrate not only their work, but also film music as well. And that's what John Williams did as well. He celebrated film music and the orchestral score and not just his stuff, but everybody else's. And I think that is part of his legacy. And if you're thinking about somebody that's doing that right now, and I hate to say the name because everybody thought he was the next John Williams, and I wish that label was not given to him because it was just a, a comment thrown out to him while he was going to get the job for the Lost World Jurassic Park video game scores, is Michael Giacchino. Um, I don't think he's John Williams. Nobody will be John Williams. But if you look at what he's doing, um, you know, he's creating concerts out in London. He's, he's, he's done stuff for the Hollywood Bowl. He, 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 he knows his craft. He knows his stuff. He celebrates the old, celebrates the new. He really has, um, he's given the palette to express himself with the collaborators that he's working with. So I think out of anybody else maybe working besides maybe, I don't even think Alan Silvestri does it. Um, but Giacchino is someone that I think that right now we might be able to rely on to help bring that John Williams sensibility to the modern world. Well, yeah, that's yeah, if you can I, accept it. I, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I've seen, uh, heard many podcasts with Michael. He's, he's great. He knows his old films. He's a real good film nut. So that, that's, that's always a good a plus. 
But the problem is, will he be given the opportunity, right? That's the thing. The filmmaker who's going to say, and, and that's been part of the battle. Most of these modern filmmakers grew up in the age where you could get to music. You listen to music all the time. It was on your phone. It was on everything, right? So they already have a predetermined what the music's going to be for a scene. They already have something in their mind when they, when they, when they, film, they, they film a scene. And, oh, why don't we get this uh, Nat King Cole? Or why don't we get Ella Fitzgerald to come in here? Which is another podcast of, of the great Cooners that we don't have anymore because uh, of another reason. But um, it, it is, it's a very interesting concept that, that we just don't have the opportunities that Michael's going to get, I think, at some point. Where we're going to say, okay, I have this adventure movie. Go ahead and just write your themes and, and, and go for it. He has a few know. collaborators that he, feel, that he works with that, I think that allows him to do it. Brad Bird, J.J. Abrams will allow him to do that sort of stuff. And you can watch some of their films and you can see where, hey, you know what? Jacino's going to save this scene. Like, the opening to star trek i mean that that's well, you know that's 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 huge emotion and that's brought on because of michael's music it doesn't happen all the time i mean you're not going to get a a six minute enterprise sequence um like in the, in the motion picture and just say goldsmith go you know um well, it's yeah, gonna there, be a there's rare a, there's thing a great story, there's a great story about that the, which i don't want to get into because this is a john williams thing but uh yeah it's it's that's the other thing when John got into music back in the late 50s, early 60s, there were 3,000 full-time studio musicians in Hollywood. Think about that, 3,000. Now there's probably about 300. Um, so uh, it's, it's definitely, it really has, the industry has really shifted from when John was first starting out, learning this craft, you know, uh, learning how to build a soundtrack up. And you can see that, of course, all through the 60s when he's doing the TV stuff and everything else. Uh, to where he just took off in the 70s. But yeah, it definitely has, has changed. And like I said, the opportunity for growing a John Williams, I just don't know if it, if it's there right now. Yeah. yeah. What about I, just, Clark, I don't think there will be Clark. another John Williams, to be quite honest, because his breadth of experience and decades of contribution over many genres and many directors, styles of films won't be matched. But yeah, people like Michael Giacchino, given another four decades of work if he's able to possibly but again as good as he is he or nobody will be another john williams i think that what they're saying is not just the music but also the film environment the, the whole context in which we watch films so when star wars came out it came out in a cinema in, in the 70s and that was the, the only way to watch the film you had to go to the cinema to go to the hall with uh, hundreds of people in a big hall you know and big sound and now you just have you no know, vhs uh in the vhs then the dvds and so now we have netflixes and and you know it's it's a whole we watch films in a whole different environment and a much different pace than what we used to back uh, then in the 70s so before you had you no know, for example films that were three hours you know they had intermissions that they had overtures and and these kinds of grand grand events they, they required a grand score uh, a grand orchestral you know experience and so i think that john williams grew up in this kind of environment and now this this environment is, is changing you know the pr film producers the film film crews they they are thinking in another ways uh, how, to, how to bring films into the home home environment and then and that and and you know it, it's not really the same experience uh, to to listen to a score at home, uh, a, a, you know, grand orchestra score. Uh, I think that that's also another. I, issue. I actually feel like we're th there's kind of two conversations happening and and kind of two questions that we're answering. One is which composer, if any, is going to you know, you know approximate John Williams' style, um, and the other, which I actually think is is the the one that I'm more interested in is like, which composer will carry on um, with the symphonic tradition and br continue to bring that to billions of people around the world? You know, in my opinion, I'm, I'm less interested in hearing different composers, you know, try their best shot at John Williams. And when I think of the composers that Williams kind of descends from, whether you think it's Korngold or Bernstein or Copeland or whoever you think it is, you know, they, they don't, John Williams doesn't sound like them. Uh, I mean, they're sure there are moments in his scores where he's clearly, you know, mimicking Korngold or, or Bernstein or whoever. But uh, I don't think what unites them is that their style of music is all that similar. I think it's more about 
um, the way they bring the, they, they keep the symphonic tradition alive, they bring it to new, new audiences, they try it in new medium, I think is actually something that interests me more. Because, uh, you know, we, there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of film scores that you can tell it's just a composer trying to mimic John Williams. And they, they, they don't really do much for me. Um, I think they're interesting and, and sometimes they're nice to listen to. But the things that I, that the, the composers I'm more interested in are the ones who can kind of do it with their own style. Um, this plot is, is one that comes to mind. I think, Brian, you might have mentioned him earlier, um, where, you know, he sounds very different than John Williams, um, but I like the way he sounds and I like that he's doing his own thing and, and not trying to be, you know, the carbon copy of, of John. Yeah, it's all very interesting. All of you guys have really just very interesting words of wisdom. I don't think there's ever going to be an answer. I think that's, it's, I don't know if we're ever going to get an answer to that. And maybe that's fine. I don't, I think we're all kind of saying there won't be another John Williams. And I think that's kind of where we're, where we are right now. And I think when back in the 60s, when people were fawning over Miklos Rocha and, and all these other composers, I don't think they were always talking about, will there ever be anybody like Miklos Rocha again? Will there be anybody like Dmitry Tiomkin again? Um, I think that we were all just like, you know, we love film scores and John Williams just kept that going and he elevated it even. And it's very interesting that we're, we're, we're trying to find somebody who could be the successor. And I don't think that conversation has ever happened in film score history. So I think it says a lot about the man more than the music, really, to be honest. Um, all right. So um, as great as this conversation is, I want to keep moving on to something else. Um, so as you know from our episode covering The Empire Strikes Back that Jim Nova is a very accomplished trombone player with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. And if you've been to his website, jimnova.com, you have seen a lot of his arrangements that he's done. I, I actually have listened to it multiple times, his um, arrangements of the kind of the Skywalker saga, if you were. Um, I think it's called From Light to Dark, um, where he kind of does some different trombone arrangements of some, some of the famous Star Wars themes. And, um, Jim has a special presentation for us today um, that is exclusive to this Baton um, Roundtable. So, Jim, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jeff. I'll uh, give a, just a quick little background. Um, so the reason that this whole kind of overdubbing thing started for me was, uh, you know, I'm the second trombone player here in, in Pittsburgh Symphony, but I, um, I'm also the utility player, which basically is just a fancy way of saying I'm sort of the Mr. Fix-It of the section. So like, I primarily play second, but I play first, I play bass, I, you know, I play all the, all the trombones, basically. And uh, here, I'll show you a quick picture. That's, uh, you got a soprano all the way down to a contrabass and then a couple other instruments over there that, so I'm, uh, I play all those instruments. And um, so about eight years, eight and a half years ago, I was looking for a fun way to get back in shape for the season, for the start of the Pittsburgh Symphony season. And I had long, long time, uh, long since done uh, several arrangements of John's music for uh, trombone choir, you know, for uh, a trombone ensemble. That started back when I was in school. My uh, primary uh, teacher at uh, in college was a name, gentleman named Glenn Dodson, who was the uh, principal trombone of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And um, he would always get these groups together and we would play these crazy trombone arrangements of various pieces. And we used to call them bone bashes, you know. And uh, so we would get together and play with the Philadelphia Orchestra section and the, the studio and we would play together. And um, so that's what kind of planted the seed. So naturally with my, you know, loving of John's music, I, I started doing arrangements as well. And about eight years ago, I started recording them all myself, just, just uh, multi-track recording them. And I really didn't expect many people to listen to them. And, uh, but as of, as of today, my SoundCloud page has passed well over a million listens. And uh, it's just crazy. I know, I'm like, you people know this is a trombone overdub, right? You know, <laughs> so, um, but a couple of uh, weeks ago, Jeff did an episode um, where he mentioned that John had written um, the NBC football theme, and I didn't even know that. As much as a John Williams fan as I am, you know, and I'm a big football fan, and of course, I mean, I live in Pittsburgh. It's like, you gotta love the Steelers when you live here. So, um, 
And so I was like, well, of course, that's the one that I like the most because that's the one John wrote because there's all these NBC, there's all these football themes and stuff. And I was like, that's the one that I like the most. So I, I got a hold of a score and uh, did a did a, uh, a little five part version of it because it's it's a it's actually kind of a testament to John's efficiency is that he can write these grand orchestral scores, but because he's um, writing them at the piano, he can kind of they can actually be boiled down and be pretty compact. And this this arrangement I'm going to play for you guys is it's only five parts, but it has all the harmony that he has fleshed out into a you know larger you know larger orchestral score in the original. Um, and it's a tune called Wide Receiver. And uh, so you only ever hear when you're watching football, you only ever hear like the first phrase. So I got the score and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. So uh, this is the, the only I recorded all the trombone parts and uh, there, I, I had to, you have to have the snare drum in this arrangement. So I put a little MIDI snare drum in it. So the snare drum is not a real person, but all the trombone parts are mine. And this is a, a world premiere arrangement. So hope you enjoy it. I was listening to wide receiver this morning when I had my coffee. I can't. <laughs> I just can't believe that that uh, you shared that with us. That's that's awesome. Yeah, it's <laughs> great stuff. <laughs> you know, it's funny is uh, a bunch of my friends like they were like they heard the original and they're like, yeah. "Wow, that's that's kind of cool that you put the uh, Imperial March quote at the end there." <laughs> and I was like, "I didn't, I didn't do that. John wrote that. I don't know if that's like his commentary on football or what, but like if you, I mean, if you look at the if you look at the score, you know, let me just open that again real quick. Uh, if you look at that score, 
Uh, take a look down at the bottom bass part in that first bar. What are those notes? Ba, 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 ba. It's yep. right there, you know. Yeah. It's right there. So yeah, I mean, I I love it. It's I could totally see uh, see him just at the at the podium, you know, working on that with that orchestra and just you know making that come to life. It's it's so cool. So yeah, I mean, I, there's no it's no small statement to say that you know his his music is definitely. The, I mean, it's one of the main reasons I play the trombone. It's one of the main reasons I went into music was 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 his you music. Know, it's, so. it's so it's it's so great <laughs> that you you brought up this fantastic arrangements, Jim. Because uh, you know, having had the the, the the honor and the privilege to talk with so many musicians who um, who played with John over the years for my like I said, John Williams podcast, uh, what is really um, really touching for me to see this kind of work is because you see that John's music touches people's lives in many ways. And this is one of the most beautiful, in my opinion, because, you know, inspiring creativity in other musicians. And, you know, you pull out the score and starting to study it and analyze it and, and see how you can crack a new arrangement out of this magnificent uh, piece. And, and, you know, just, you know, working on your own craft, on your own knowledge, and maybe finding that you are discovering something new about the process of writing and arranging and, and putting together a, a piece of music. And that's one of the, really one of the greatest gifts that John is leaving to, to, to the world. I think. Well, when, when you mentioned earlier, but you were talking about discipline. And um, one of my favorite stories about John is that, um, you know, he has this real regimented schedule. He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have a computer. He doesn't have a smartphone. He doesn't have any of that. In fact, apparently his agent or his uh, assistant handed him like a flip phone at one point and said, look, you have to have this just in case. You just need to have this. And I don't think he's ever t even turned it on, you know, and he writes everything by hand at the piano with pencil and paper. But I heard the story recently that, you know, he, I don't know what his schedule is now with, with COVID and everything, but during when, when, the world was normal. <laughs> um, he would get up at a certain time in the morning and compose at a certain time for a few hours and then have lunch. And then, you know, it was a very set schedule every day. So set that his son, um, who has a key to his house, you know, came in, came in one night. And then the next morning when, it, when John got up, his son was in the, in the kitchen, like eating something. And John says to him, what, Hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, dad, it's, it's Christmas day. And uh, like he just he didn't even know what day it was because it's just the ske his schedule is so solid and regimented, you know. But, you know, when we were talking earlier about the his legacy and just like what I mean, he's such a unique combination of, uh, you know, a Juilliard trained pianist who had a jazz drummer dad. And then, you know, uh, you know, the, his experiences out in L.A. And when, you know, we all think about the 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 post Boston pops era of like how it was this love fest. But it, in fact, when he first started in Boston, there was a lot of trouble there of like the, the orchestra didn't really, it was just such a, such a difficult adjustment for the orchestra to play these, you know, I mean, most of the, most of the musicians were talking about how his music is harder than R Richard Strauss, you know, it's like, it's, it's just you know, harder to play than the hardest excerpts we usually play. And, um, but, you know, by the time I got to Boston, started working with him there, um, I will never forget this one. This is one of my favorite stories of, of his is the, the Boston Red Sox made it to the playoffs and they asked the Boston Pops brass section to come and play the national anthem and John Williams was going to conduct it. And so we, we get to the rehearsal and we're just playing this basic B flat major arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner. And so we play it through once. And from the podium, John says, he just, he stops and he goes, he just, he, he was like, he was, the gears were clicking in his head and he looks up and he goes, okay, bar three, I want you, uh, second trumpet play G flat, tuba, I want you to play C flat here, uh, second trombone F G here. You know, he started like changing the arrangement just off the top of his head, just off the top of his head. And he's like, do this here, do that. And then he's like, okay, everybody got it? Let's try it. And we tried it and it was all of a sudden, it was a John Williams arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner. We played it once and he goes, okay, great. So uh, we'll do it from memory tomorrow, right? Okay, bye. And he just left and we, we had to play it on, the, on a playoff baseball game, like, you know, with a huge crowd from memory 
with him conducting, you know, then I just I, that that kind of ability, uh, I think, is what has earned him such cachet with musicians and audience alike. I mean, like you can't you 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 take a you know ten year old kid and you go ba 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 ba. They're like, oh yeah, Imperial March, you know. <laughs> but oh you know, yeah, do, well you know, and, but that gets into a lot of other things. Um, uh, the fact that um, you can't recognize themes from movies. I mean, how many Marvel movies have we had? 20 some odd. And I can't think of anybody can name me a, can hum me a theme from any of those Marvel movies. Um, and the other thing about studio players, uh, they also things, uh, it, you know, they have the click tracks now, right? If you see a, if you see a motion picture or studio today, they all got headphones on and they're listening to that click track and that's what they play to uh, they follow the conductor somewhat i had several musicians tell me that what they loved about john was he would come in there and say okay let's tell you what t turn off the click track for a second we're going to do something different and he'll just take them right off a of script and, and work with something he saw in the music that he can conduct better than the click track was laid out for so uh yeah the, definitely he's just an amazing in that well respect. the other one other thing, I, I got to compliment you on your arrangements as one who also does trombone choir and, and uh, no other instrument does trombone, does choirs like trombone. I don't know. I don't know of any other instrument that does that. Totally does agree. Much choir with. <laughs> uh, but the only problem with Jim Nova's arrangements is you need Jim Nova to play. <laughs> <laughs> well, because John is, you know, try, writing the trombone choir with John Williams music, you, you get yourself into a box of ranges and all sorts of fun things that, that doesn't lend itself to that. Uh, for some reason, Elmer Bernstein is wonderful for trombone choir as far as just simplicity and, and making it sound great. He's there. John is always, Goldsmith is impossible, by the way. It's, he's very, you, have you done Goldsmith yet, Jim? Not yet. Oh, very Not difficult. Yet. Very difficult. Jim, I have a question for you as a fellow musician. Uh, I would be petrified of coming in at the wrong time during any John Williams uh, score because his syncopation is just out of this world. And I can see when I watch performances, especially the brass section, they're just counting like crazy. And they're, I think, praying that they don't come in <laughs> at the wrong time. Well, I, it's funny, you know, I, this big phenomenon now that's starting where they're doing films uh, live with, uh, with a live orchestra, you know, sort of like getting to sit down and play the score to Empire Strikes Back, the score to Star Wars with the film playing. They've removed the soundtrack. They've removed right. the music from it. And, um, you know, I, I've actually found it to be the opposite. Uh, like, uh, I, I don't even need to count on those because I've listened to them so many times that like, I know exactly where everything goes. In fact, it's one of the only, the, the, the orchestra did um, the original Star Wars, you know, a couple years, a couple summers ago, and I was playing at a festival, uh, a trombone festival in Iowa, and I literally drove through the night to get to rehearsal on time to, to you know, and the, the person was like, hey, how do you, you could have just taken this off. I was like, are you kidding me? I wouldn't, there's no, this, I'd go, I'd miss any other concert of the year, but you know, I'm not missing this one. And when we did Empire, that was really the one that sealed it for me. I mean, but yeah, it's his new music, his, his more recent stuff is definitely getting trickier and trickier for oh, yeah. sure, you know. I, I it's kind of funny because remember when John came on the scene back in the 70s, a lot of the orchestra is like, oh, man, that's not real classical music. And they, they really were downplaying John as far as an impact on the whole genre. But mm. now they have to use him to bring people in so they mm -hmm. can get them hooked on the other great works of art like the Beethovens and stuff right. like that. But they right. use it as a hook to get them in. You bet. Uh, and I, I did talk to uh, a guy in the Chicago Symphony uh, who was – telling me that uh yeah those those are marathon concerts though because remember john didn't really write those for a, right you know to be done like that but you're gonna the brass section especially is just sitting there just pounding away on uh, depending on what score it is uh, uh, uh so it's pretty hard to get through those so i oh uh, yeah i actually have a, a funny story related to um coming in in the wrong spot uh this was at one of the hollywood bowl concerts and the first encore that williams did was yoda's theme the second encore was the Star Wars main title. 
and evidently mm-hmm. the, the crash cymbal player mixed up the order of those two oh. and thought that the first encore was the main title. And so on the downbeat of, of slow, quiet, peaceful, serene Yoda's theme, we get a huge crash cymbal and, and it was a glorious moment. Well, I think that seems to follow him around because when I was in Boston, you know, playing as much as I was with the Boston Pops, that happened as well. Like where the the score, it was Jaws that was supposed to be first and and then main title. And so it wasn't the cymbal player. It was the first trumpet player just came in blasting on that high B flat. And like, and, and, and John just stopped. He just stopped. And he turned to the audience. He says, "We're going to try that again," and uh, and we did it again. And then after that, that became the joke. Every concert, even when John wasn't on the podium, when we get to the encores, everybody would be like, "All right, Star Wars, Star Wars, yeah, it's Star Wars, Star Wars, the first encore." Yep, that's yeah, it was like really funny. That's, that's but he, you know, you, uh, I think, I think Jeff Owens, you were the one who was asking me about being afraid yeah. of coming in wrong. Well, I mean, he, I, I. Playing for John, I mean, he is absolutely. I mean, there's a difference in a concert version of him, whereas, whereas, he, whereas he's, when he's recording, because we did the Winter Olympics, my first season in the Utah Symphony, we recorded the, the that was the you know when the Winter Olympics were in Salt Lake City, and um, we did the main theme. They wrote a new theme for it for the Utah Symphony and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and watching how different he is when he's recording, he's even more detail oriented and more. Uh, insistent, but never in an unfriendly way. It's always like playing for your favorite uncle or your grandfather or something. He's just so he gives you a cue as if he's inviting you into his house, and and it just you don't. He sets everyone up to play their best. That's why somebody so so many people love playing for him, and playing with him, and write to him, and you know do all these kind of things. And so it's. it's I think his conducting you know, is underappreciated because that's that's something. That not everybody has that gift mm-hmm. of. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh boy. Of course, he, of course, you know he honed that with the Boston Pops, but that uh, that gift well, of being able to to like you said to bring out the best from players is not some something that everybody has. Oh well, and and he is he wasn't he didn't start that way. I know when he started in Boston, he actually asked the orchestra to kind of help him. You know, he said, "Look, I'm not a conductor. I'm a composer, and uh, I'm going to need your help." But that's the funny thing is, is everybody said he's terrific whereas on that same recording where we did the the opening of the winter olympics we did a, a we did a michael Kamen piece uh and i at one point i was having such a hard time following him that i put my stand <laughs> up so that i couldn't see him anymore and i just was using my ears because i was like i feel like i'm at the free throw line at an nba game here you know like with the streamers going and stuff like it it was just impossible to follow but john is yeah no, completely john, the opposite uh, if you, you know? look at the a lot of the guest conductors that are floating out there that come into town and you know one night wonders type things he's amazing uh because uh, i i've seen some videos on on youtube a lot when i on how is the orchestra following this guy you know, it's it's like there's no downbeat here, and I don't know. You know, it's it's really interesting. I, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I I always feel for the orchestra when when they get a guest conductor or something that comes in that's that's kind of above basic uh, conducting skills. Well, if you want to see a, a really great example of John smiling and enjoying the music and being with the orchestra, uh, that one of my favorite videos is uh, when Arturo Sandoval, you know, famous. Uh, jazz trumpet player and composer oh, yeah. you yes. know he, oh, yeah. his his debut with the boston pops is from like the 80s or something mm-hmm. like that and in the opening he's conducting and the you know the trombones come in with this big melody and and he comes in after it and he's just beaming it, it just the look on his face is just like he's just loving this incredible amount of sound that's coming at him you know he's and and i just i was that that, those kind of videos i mean when i was a little kid watching pbs you know broadcasts of the boston pops that's that's part of what led me to go study there and study with those guys i mean um and i think maurizio just did a podcast with uh with tim morrison you know who is the the solo trumpet player on jfk and all those Mm -hmm. great scores um and when i first got to boston tim was still in um was still in boston playing so i got to sit in that brass section and play and 
um, it was just a, a real magical experience to watch how different the orchestra would play with him than with anyone else. You know, not they would still play great, but there, there, there's a story out here in in Hollywood Land that when John went back to Boston, uh, he got used to Bach trombones. And out in the West Coast, Khan was still the king back then, and so when John started getting used to this Bach trombone sound, everybody in Hollywood went out and bought a I Bach believe it <laughs> because they wanted to. Make sure I believe it. I believe horn. it. Yeah. Hey, um, so before we uh, get too far away from that performance of, of Jim's arrangement, I want to, Alex, as a trombone player, I want to know what, what you think about that arrangement. I'm sure when you were listening to it, you, you were just like, I want to play that. I, I equally want to play it, and I'm terrified of it. <laughs> but, um, no, Jim, your arrangements are fantastic because... Um, I mean, there's just, there's always just so much there. I mean, yes, he writes it out on, on piano, but I mean, some of those, uh, especially the Star Wars scores, there are a million different moving parts. And so it's also fantastic to hear it because John Williams is a fantastic orchestrator. I mean, he knows exactly how to write for each instrument, but then to hear it all with the same instrument, I mean, it works just as well somehow. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it, I, that's, a, that's one thing that, that his stuff is difficult, but it's not impossible. It's, it's, it's very yeah. logical musically. And so it just inspires the musician to work that hard to, to, to make it work. I well, I mean, when I go and I do like some concerts with, with university trombone choirs and such and, and go visits and, and I've, I've noticed a trend that a lot of the, kids you know at those schools would be like oh we're so scared to play these arrangements because we can't play them as well as you can and i was like well you have to remember that i get unlimited chances when i'm recording i'm, <laughs> I'm taking i'm taking all these chances because i'm trying to yeah it's been a great bar you know razor for me too like if you look at some of my early arrangements to now you know the level of precision and difficulty you know is meant to challenge me too so uh my response to those kids is usually like well I can't play it live as well as my recording either, you know, and, and I'm just, and I'm the one who did the arrangement. Although on the flip side of that, it gives me tremendous moral high ground. No one ever says they're not playable because I'll just be like, oh, really? Let me refer you to my recording here. You know, like, it's hard. Definitely. It's a challenge. But I think John's music deserves to be like I, when I do an arrangement, I start out with what sounds best, you know, what sounds the, the truest. And I mean, you know, to bring, it back to talking about John, just just looking at those scores and making those arrangements and seeing what he's done with voicing and how, oh, you know, writing that chord this way may still have the same notes, but it doesn't sound the same as the way he wrote it. And so I'll constantly be pushing the envelope in those in those realms, you know, and doing I've done them for brass ensemble, too. And, and that phrase you said earlier, Doug, has been said to me, too, like I, I I've approached, you know, the John's publisher about doing about publishing these arrangements and one of them wrote back he said yeah but nobody can play them but you and I was like <laughs> I was like yeah. so you're saying I'm the greatest trombone player in the world I don't think so uh, yeah. I, well, I no, beg it, to differ you know pub publishers remember their their thing is I want to sell as many as I can right and well it, problem is if you're a, a, a professor of, of a trombone choir and you're coming to look at music you're opening it up and going can my guys sound good with this and that's when that's when that that hits the road, right? Yeah, but you know, I I uh, I will say that whenever I do my concerts uh, at these schools, what's really fun is that the kids will usually say some version of this statement. They'll say, you know, this was the hardest concert we've ever played, but it was the most fun. And then one of the one of the professors said, you know, I've been trying to get so these couple of kids to practice their multiple tonguing for ages and they won't and then i put your imperial march arrangement in front of them and now they won't stop playing it you know like they won't stop working on those extended techniques and so that's been i'm slowly chipping away i'm chipping away i'm uh, you know i think uh eventually they'll they'll come around so that, that one so. john williams question i always had when he's when he's writing yeah. <laughs> when he's writing these things he, he, he picks a key, I guess he's going to, he, I don't does he go key first and say, hey, what's my mood here? Or is he going to say, well, what kind of, what bunch of instruments am I going to use here? And what key would be good to put them in? Right. I, it, it, it's, it's because again, when you read through his stuff, it's, it's, it's written very well for each instrument. And it's, it's mm -hmm. uncanny of how he does that. 
Yeah. 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 One day we'll get, yeah, he's, one he's day maybe he'll get down percent. and we get to ask all these questions. That will be, I, ha, I have a hundred of them oh, and I've gone yeah. through 60, well, 82 <laughs> years of his life. So I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, well, our, uh, our local uh, orchestra, the Calgary Philharmonic, the past three concert masters have quite publicly said the only reason the CPO is still around and I don't know how it is in, Ontario, Eric, but they've, you know, been in Western Canada. They say the only reason the small local symphonies are around is John Williams, that the, his concerts will sell out and the people play it. And our current uh, concert master is hated by the orchestra in any John Williams concert because he, before they play, points out how intricately difficult this passage that you're so familiar <laughs> with is to play. And then you get to watch the whoever is doing it, whether it's the trombone or the strings, you know, and you can just see them give him the eye, but they, they always play it beautifully. And then he certainly points out afterwards how beautifully they played and just reminds the audience just how effing hard it is to uh, play <laughs> that music. Think of, well, uh, the the um, La La Land release of Superman, uh, I think it's the, the second disc has some of the outtakes and it's the planet Crypt on and the trumpet is just soaring and he fracks the very last note i mean you've got lati and then rado <laughs> down to it um which i mean just completely ruins it and i laugh every time that i listen to it but it's it's so incredibly difficult but it it works well and it it is playable <laughs> it's just it takes so much uh practice well, to play it and uh, sometimes some luck, I think. You know that that uh, Superman score was Maurice Murphy, the principal trumpet player in the London. That was his first day on the job. Can you imagine showing up for work and turning the page and being like, "Oh, what's this lovely thing?" You know, I thought that was Star Wars. I thought Maurice Murphy was Star Wars. I thought he got the. Yeah, was, I think Star uh, Wars first... was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think you're first, right. His I first you're day right. was think, Star Wars. I it was. Yeah. Yeah. The main yeah. thing for Star not Wars. a bad way to start your career. Right? Oh, yeah, so. right. The first high B flat there. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was the right. easy. Was the easy. <laughs> Star Wars was the easy. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are all great stories. I've, I've just, I, I could sit here all day and listen to all these stories. It's, I mean, we, we have so much great things. Do a to part talk about two. Do Williams. a part two, Jeff. Yeah, we definitely do a part two on this. Do a part two. Keep the keep the keep the podcast going. We'll come back weekly. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Some of you say weekly. Some of you say weekly. You 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 don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> Some of, you weekly, only, whatever, whatever. some of you have only done one, us, one episode. Us. You don't know what it's like that to, to keep this up. You don't have to. You don't know what it's like. But yeah, maybe we'll do. We'll come back again, especially if he does say he's going to do ND five. But you know, maybe down the road, I'll I'll bring you guys back because this has just been fun. This has been, and I'm and again, I'm getting emotional yeah. just seeing all of you on the screen and and hearing all these these conversations. And um, yeah, I don't want it to end. So maybe we have to continue this. Um, so, um, yeah, again, I, I'm just over the moon about this. I mean, it's just, I mean, to, to talk, I, mean, I don't think anybody, there's in, no other film composer that is, can, we can have somebody talk, we can have a group of people talking about them for two hours. I really don't think so. I doubt it. It may be somewhere. Yeah, definitely uh, no. Can I just put out two questions? Please Jeff, do. could I just put out two quick questions? Yep. One to uh, Paulius and David, and... Uh, anyone else can chime in on this, but Paulius and David are the ones that seem to really break the themes down. So curious, when Jeff and I talked about Crystal Skull, I said that the uh, call of the, the, the skull sounded somewhat familiar to the Close Encounters little five mo motif. Was I high on something or was I on to something? All you musically thematic guys, would do you think the uh, call of the Crystal Skull was a, a little... Uh, call back to that uh, close encounters motive, or was I imagining things? It's a common thing, I think, uh, when you analyze the themes, there's always the callbacks to something else, and it's difficult to know if that was intentional or if it's just your fantasy. And uh, I experienced a lot of that myself, and I analyzed themes, you know, is this from from Harry Potter, or is this from one of the prequels, or, you know, it's... I, I think you just sometimes have to go with it and... Uh, assert a theory and then support it. It's not always easy to know what they had in mind. Actually, that, that kind of makes sense though, wouldn't it? Because, you know, uh, Close Encounters being aliens and the Crystal Skull being an alien? 
right? Who knows? I wonder if it was an Easter egg. That's how I was Yeah, thinking. exactly. Yeah. I always felt it was like, and then a, Jeff, like a, a retrograde of his art theme. Oh. But that could be, I'm just looking into it too much. <laughs> <laughs> but it had, I, I always felt it had that feel more of the mysterious arc music. Um, but I never really put a connection to Close Encounters. But that's interesting. I'm, it's interesting I'm just thought. wondering if it's not so much he was calling back to Close Encounters. That's just what aliens sound like to him. You know, <laughs> they're, they're similar because that's what aliens are. Yes, that's a good I, I point. Actually, I actually hear West Side Story in that uh, the ostinato that underlays the, the call of the crystal theme. But I'm 100% sure that that was not an intentional reference. That's just my brain mm-hmm. here in the Oh, thanks. It's an underrated theme for sure, though. It doesn't get enough play. Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we close out this, what may be part one, um, Brian, you haven't said much. You got any final thoughts about what you've heard, What you anything you want to contribute before we sign off today? <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> Actually, it's nice to see so many CDs in uh, people's backgrounds. Uh, maybe uh, the CD isn't quite as dead as we were led to believe. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that, that's that, that's my wife's uh, deep uh, um, uh, Blu-ray connection. She's a classic film blogger, and they send her screeners all the time. So my room is full. Hey, of Jeff. Them. Actually, I want to ask. I was wondering. So, in the Return of the Jedi episode, you talked about trying to get in contact with Joseph Williams, and just kind of wondering how that came. Were you, were you contacting like an agent or some kind of representative? Or? Yeah, I reached out to. His, I found out who his agent was, and then. Um, you know, I, I, tr- I actually reached out to Joseph himself on Twitter and didn't get a response there. And I was, you know, I was just like, you know, thinking, OK, if I'm not going to get John Williams, I got to get as close to him as I could. And this was a great way to talk about Return of the Jedi. And when his agent said he was busy, I mean, that may have been true. He was touring with the Toto band at the time. Um, you know, I'm kind of I was just kind of wondering, I'm like, this is Return of the Jedi a sore subject for Joseph Williams because they they took all of his contributions out when they did the 1997 release. I mean, all of his stuff. <laughs> yeah. gone. Yeah. Oh, so, oh. <laughs> so I didn't, I was wondering if he just, you know, didn't ever want to talk about return of the Jedi ever again. And I, I could kind of understand that. So that was kind of my thinking around it, uh, whether it's not, whether it's true or not, that's just what I think, which is a sad thing. Cause um, Yub Nub is, a great composition. I really like it. I mean, every time I listen, if I have a preference for the endings of Return of the Jedi, I always go back to the original. It's just so much better. It's just so much fun. Um, any final thoughts? Anybody have any any final thoughts? I have one question for you, Jeff. Uh, what's up for you next? Um, well, actually, I've already started doing this. So I, I recorded my finale episode on December 16th. And I said, after Christmas, I'm going to get back to the piano because I haven't played the piano in two years. This podcast has taken over my, my musical um, progression in my life. So I'm actually getting, I actually, the day after Christmas, sat down and started playing the piano again. I actually have my old textbook from my um, little community college piano class I took and started reading through that again. and was like, oh yeah, that's right. Okay. And, you know, it had some very, very beginner stuff and just started just moving my fingers again. I just haven't played them on a piano for two years, Um, with the exception of me having some sheet music for some episodes and, you know, me just playing a couple of things on the piano just so I could hear it better. But um, that's going to that's what I'm going to do. I want to I want to further my music education. I'm never going to be Jim or Alex or or Doug or any of you guys. I'm never going to be as good as as you guys, but I just want to be able to you know, if I want to sit down piano and play something, I want to do that. And I think probably my first goal, um, six years ago, I learned how to play the thing from Schindler's List on piano. It wasn't great. Um, you can actually find it on my YouTube channel. Um, but I said after that, um, I want to get back to it and I want to actually play it perfectly with no mistakes because it's really on the piano. One of my, it's my favorite piano thing that John Williams has ever written. Actually the most beautiful thing. So, um, cause it brings me to tears every time. And, um, so I want to be able to play it perfectly. And my goal is by the end of February to be able to, um, do it perfectly. So that's what I'm doing now. Hey Jeff, um, do you have like a top three or five 
episodes, like one that maybe you learned the most from or the one that you were just dying to explore and, and, and you're glad you did? Oh my goodness, Eric, that's, a lot of people have asked questions about <laughs> me doing a podcast, nobody's asked that. Um, let's see, so I was really, really excited to explore um, the Witches of Eastwick further. Um, because it's really, it's, it's my fifth favorite score and to just really dive deep into the exploration of the music. I had, I had been looking forward to it since the first episode. Um, I think when I go back to the stuff that's pre all this popular stuff, I was really looking forward to, to looking into none but the brave, um, big war film, um, because I had actually seen it on TV just a little bit before I started doing the episode, I didn't know it was on. And I was flipping through. It was like, oh my God, it's Number of the Brave. And it was like the last 10 minutes. And I listened to the music, watched it. It was like, oh, I can't wait to get to that. So when I finally got to that and explored it, and, and you know, I didn't know how you know, Frank Sinatra was involved in that. And I was just like down this rabbit hole of, of information about this one film and how it even inspired some future stuff. You know, it was his first time writing for Japanese instruments, which would influence Memories of Geisha. And um, you know, the stuff he was doing with the drums was amazing. And then I think third was just Star Wars, um, just to be able to dive deep into it. And this was even before I got um, Sir Clive to, to do the interview. I just wanted to just explore that music and to really talk about um, that main theme. And, and Chris was great to be able to, to help me with that. Um, because I, as many of you have known, some of your episodes, I've talked about the perfect fifth how much I love the perfect fifth and John Williams's music and star Wars has plenty of them. And, um, just to be able to examine the, the excitement about the perfect fifth and what it really means and why it kind of generated that emotion from me. Um, so yeah, that's it. Which is of Eastwick, um, none with the brave and star Wars. Yeah. I don't know if I could think of any others. They're all kind of equal. All the ones that I, of the movies I'd never seen, of course, the ones like pre 19, 70, all those I had never seen except for um, How to Steal a Million. That was the only one pre-1970 that I had ever seen before this. Um, I'm glad I actually saw Daddy-O, um, even though every single minute of it is just torture. It's not a great movie. Um, but all those movies, I mean, it just, I mean, just to hear things like, oh, yeah, like with I Pass for White, you know, that was his first time writing thematic material. And then just going along, you can hear things that's like, okay, I bet you he's going to lean back on this. He's going to remember this compositional technique and whatnot. And, you know, as we go along, just as you just hear, I can reference, I can say, oh, yeah, I remember when he did that with None But the Brave. And then here, um, when he did with Memoirs of a Geisha. Yeah, he wrote for the Sakuhachi flute before. And he, so he knows this instrument well. Um, but they're all, they've all been great. I've just enjoyed every single one of them, even the, the scores that I going in didn't like beforehand. Um, Polyus knows how much I just was not a fan of the sequel trilogy. And, and um, Brian knows how much I was not looking forward to Crystal Skull. But, um, <laughs> and, and even um, Brian Thompson. I mean, I, I remember watching Space Camp. And every, I mean, I've seen it three times before we did our episode. And I just couldn't remember a note of the music. And then I watched it again. And it was like, there's some really good stuff in here. And it's just, it's one of those things you're just like, yeah, yeah I, I throw away the movie, but you know, there's some little gems in there. And, and actually, um, I actually, if I tend to, I have a list of um, cues that I've plucked out of some of the scores every, every once in a while and things that I'll listen to every once in a while if I'm doing something around the house. And um, the shuttle landing from Space Camp is actually one of my favorite it's just excellent it's really kind of inspiring because as it should be you know they're all they come back home um, so I just love those little moments you know that I'm like oh yeah, yeah I never heard that before well, I, I tell you that the, the danger with that not danger but the 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 elation what you're going to find out is when you start breaking them down on piano you're just going to go even crazier because just how much more talent is there uh, oh, with yeah. these melodies and how they fit and how they work it's just amazing he can come up with this stuff. Oh, and the and the command, the absolute like gripping command of harmony that he has. I mean, like that's one of the fun things about doing those overdubs is that I, you know, do like one of my favorite ones that I did and just was blown away by the harmony was um, 
the Anakin's dark deeds. Like hearing that, hearing those chords, and like sitting there and going, "Yeah, that horror sound. How does he get that?" And you know, oh yeah, he's adding this flat sixth here, and you know, and just hearing it all put together little by little. You know, that that actually has been more impressive to me than his incredible memorable melody making. Is the the harmony and how he can. I think that's how he can take one theme and make it mean so many different things in the movie is is the harmony. And so, yeah, Jeff, once you start getting your piano chops going, uh, let me know. I'll send you some scores and you can you can play around with them like on piano. Uh, you might need a third arm to play all the notes and the chords properly. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know yeah, you're speaking about piano, um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with watching the I don't know, going off a tangent. Sorry, but there I. I just saw this video and I think it was when Williams was out in Japan with the Boston Pops. He was on a tour and some YouTube channel just uploaded um, Williams on piano playing the tennis game from Witches of Eastwick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that, insane. That was, uh, it's insane. With the, Boston, uh, the Boston Pops and uh, Seiji Ozawa is, uh, is conducting them. Yeah. You had to, right. had to have And I've never seen finger. so much joy. It was insane to to see him perform that it was crazy i love watching and he's so that. modest but that he's was so amazing. modest about it oh he doesn't yes, indeed. lead with that that he's basically a concert pianist you know like he studied yeah. he studied yeah. in uh juilliard with rosina levine who was van clyburn's uh teacher exactly. and he was in he was in van's studio and they would play and he actually said that that was one of the reasons he's Went the composing route. He was like, I wasn't going to play as good as Van. <laughs> oh, but he is wild. so good, though. That's the thing. He's so good, and yeah. especially that piece. Like, I mean, it it just looks ridiculously difficult, yeah. um, and just way just in total sync with the orchestra as well. It was that's just one of my favorite things I I seen in the past month or two. I the big the grin on my face. I was like, this is incredible, and I'd never seen it before. And it was like, but thirty some odd years old. It was uh, it was just delightful. Yeah, there's I mean, one, one of them playing uh, so the theme good. from Sabrina too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. out there. That's yeah, really that's good. Beautiful. I mean, that's what's so yeah. good about John is that he he's so good in all those areas that we've all talked about: uh, composition, orchestration, everything, conducting. But he's so modest. He's so modest. He's so unassuming. He's always. Pu pushing the uh, the compliments to somebody else, to the musicians, to the orchestra, um, to other composers, to the composers that have come before him, and um, and I think that's the best thing about John. Yeah, absolutely right, absolutely right. Well, I was going to close out this episode with my um, usual closing, but I was thinking, you know what? None of you ever got to do that closing, so I'm going to leave it up to you guys. So everybody unmute, and we're going to close out this episode. And you guys get to say my last final sentence. Go for it. The baton is down. The baton is the down. The baton, baton is down. Is down. Is down. Is down. Uh, early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I, I, thank you for saying that. Actually, that got me really emotional to hear you guys say that. <laughs> um, so thank you guys again. This has been a lot of fun. If, if I do a part two, I'm going to reach out to you. We're going to do it again. I, I mean, no like, we, could, we could talk for three hours about stuff. And Please I, could, do, and I would love Please to do, do it. Let's do some more. Yeah. All right. I hope well, you do, honestly, I hope you do more. I mean, I know you need a break, but you know what? There's a lot of other hidden gems in his TV and classical work. Yes. I think that... I think that a couple yes. of special episodes here and there and, and bringing some yeah. musicians that played it or special whatever, episodes, I think you yeah. got to do it. I think you got to continue with it. Okay. Got to do right. the Lost in Space theme season. Oh, oh, yeah, you know, Just explore cool. Lost in Space. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, that's the concert I always wish they would do at the Hollywood Bowl is, is non-movie, John Williams non-movie stuff. Just yeah. to, because I think yeah. there's, a, like you said, there's a lot there. That, yeah. That, uh, I think you could have yeah. a lot of fun with it, Jeff, honestly. Yeah. I think you could. All right. Well, you're holding my feet to the fire. I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. But I the will. The baton is not down. The baton is is the baton is at rest. Temporarily right. the baton is, down. The baton right. is temporarily yeah. down. That's yes. right. Who knows? It may be picked up again. I, I wanted to do it. I just have to find the. You know, I want to be able to watch the episodes and go with it, and um, absolutely, and, and be able to you know have access to the music and and all that. But um, yeah, this will be that will be fun to do. I, I do want to do it and we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see. Excellent. All right. Thanks everybody again. Um, everybody for watching. This has just been so much fun and um, see you next time.
Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>